All right, your turn. Stand. Let's get the video cameras on you. And we'll pay that church off with the funniest home video reward. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Did you enjoy the Father's Day jive? <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all of you. And uh, I'm excited about being here today. This is by far the easiest sermon I have ever prepared for as far as content goes. By far the most difficult sermon that I have ever had to prepare for emotionally or mentally. I made it through the nine o'clock and uh, I was telling somebody uh, afterwards, I said, my father would tell us all the time, square your shoulders, lift your chin, put your game face on and do what you're called to do. And uh, so that's what I'm going to do today. But I wanted to share with you some lessons that I learned uh, from my father. And uh, the interesting thing about becoming a dad, whether uh, that is in the natural or even in the spiritual, um, I think we can all relate to this. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, kind of about the role of a spiritual father. And, and when you become a natural father or a spiritual father, when you have somebody in your life that calls you dad, the first part of their life, they think you can do no wrong. Man, my dad can do anything. Then they get to be an adolescent into a teenager, and you can do no right. <laughs> then you come to that kind of next stage of life where it's, you know, I understand that we all make mistakes. We fumble, we fail, we falter. But you're my father, and I'm going to appreciate whether you're doing it right or you're doing it wrong. I'm just going to appreciate you because you're my father. And I think sometimes we just need to give dads a little bit of slack. They're trying to live out something that doesn't include an instruction manual. And dads are being required to make decisions that we don't always have all the answers to. And then hindsight is perfect. And so sometimes we get into life and we're like, man, my dad should have made a different decision or he should have done. I think so, a lot of dads uh, need to be allowed some latitude to make mistakes in their life. And for people to go ahead and respect them, even though they don't always get it right. Because the only person that has ever gotten it all right is Jesus. And uh, so if you're in this house and you're a dad, we honor you, we respect you, we love you. And you could be a lot of places, but you are in the house of the Lord. And we're thankful for that. In the 9 o'clock service, they asked me how I was going to get through the 18 things that I learned from my father. And I said, and that's why you're praying. And I did it in five minutes at my father's funeral. Uh, but I wanted to share with you just some things that I learned from my dad. And the reason why I feel like it is so important is that right now in America, two out of every five children will grow up in America without a dad. 50% of all children in America will spend a part of their childhood without a dad. 50%. I think dads are extremely important in our lives and the lessons that we need to learn from them. I think our society is on the path that it is on right now because we are missing relationships with our fathers. And what is happening in the natural is having a massive spiritual effect because as they have a lack of a relationship with their natural father, they struggle to come into relationship with a spiritual father. And so we must get these relationships right and learn some lessons uh, from our father. So I'm just going to give you some 18 things. It's just uh, a little bit of the things that I learned from my dad. And my dad never sat me down and said, here's the lessons you need to learn. I caught more than I was taught. And now that I look back over his life and the life that I was involved with uh, in him, uh, I learned a lot of things from him. And the first thing that I learned was uh, that you must educate yourself, and education never ends. You have to consistently be trying to learn and learn as much as you can by reading, being involved, getting involved in everything. There are wonderful benefits of an education, both in the natural and in the spiritual. The, book, the Bible says to listen to what I say and treasure my commands and tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight 
and ask for understanding and search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. You have to educate yourself. And so the, one of the, the other things I learned, and I learned this lesson from my dad after learning a new word at school that day on the playground. Um, and uh, we would always sit down and have family dinners. And before I chide you about family dinners, it is a rare occasion that my family sits down and has dinner together. But we, in my house, back when I was a kid, we always had dinner together. We waited for dad to get home from work. And so I'm not quite sure what the conversation was that day, but my father said something to me, and I told my dad to go blank himself. And I learned this lesson, that you must learn how to express yourself without using four-letter words. I have never forgotten that lesson that night. And I thought that that was a unique lesson until at my dad's funeral where his business partner was reading um, many of the things that my dad was about when he was a younger man and what his dad said to my dad. And one of the things that Bill Nolan Sr. said to my father, he told him that he must improve his language and display his intelligence through his command of the English language. So my dad began to pass that lesson down to us. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 24, it says, to put away from you crooked speech... And put devious talk far from you. And I think we need to learn how to command our language. In the natural, man, some people use uh, the slang and curse words just to fill up every space in every conversation. But more than that, I think we as Christians must learn how to talk, spiritually speaking. The Bible says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And a lot of the reason why we're in the position that we're in, the condition that we are in, is we are not commanding using our language. And we need to educate ourselves in the Word of God and then use our education to command our language, our speech, to live a better life by what we say. And we must begin to show people what it's like to talk the talk and not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. This the third lesson I learned, I, I learned this lesson early on in my life. But standing uh, at my dad's uh, visitation, I heard many, many stories about my dad. I, I knew that my dad was a generous man. I just had no comprehension of how generous my dad was until uh, people would come. And they had traveled all the way across the country to express to us as a family uh, how generous my father was to them. But my dad taught us that you have to be a generous person. And in generosity, my dad would teach us that if you're going to give something to someone, you have to give them the very things that you would want to receive. And I always thought that that was kind of a, a strange thing, you know, but I, I began to learn a lot more about my father over the last six months. I probably learned more about my father's early years in his life than I did my entire life. My dad just didn't talk much about things, but I realized uh, now I know why that when we went to Popeye's chicken, my dad would only, only order white meat. My dad uh, refused to eat dark meat chicken uh, uh, my entire life. And uh, I realize now why, because, m of course, my, my grandfather, my dad's dad, died when my dad was 10 years old. And they, of course, in that season of life, they did not have any money. And uh, so they lived off of charity, people uh, giving them things. And the, so what would happen is, is the families would eat all the chicken that they wanted. And then whatever was left over, they would bring over to my uh, dad's family and they would eat. So they got the gizzards and they got all the things that nobody else wanted. And my dad took that as a principle for the rest of his life that he was going to give people exactly what he would want to receive. And so when we gave uh, food to people, uh, matter of fact, traditionally what would happen is my dad would uh, go to their house. And this is how I knew that my dad was generous. My, we would go to their house. We would walk up to their front door and we would put them in our car and we would go to the grocery store and every member of their family got a grocery cart. And we would walk them through the grocery store and they would load up the grocery carts and then we would take it to their house and we would carry it into their house. That, that's how my family began to operate. But my dad would tell me, if you're going to give money or you're going to give food to a food bank, then you don't go buy the off-brand unless you eat the off-brand. 
But if you eat Campbell's, then you go buy Campbell's and you give to people what you would want to receive back if you were on the other end of it. And I think our society needs to have a good lesson in that because, man, when we have people give things to us, it's outdated. Uh, they're like, I would never eat this, but here you go. You guys figure out something to do with it. If you're going to learn the lesson of generosity, learn to give people things that you would want to receive. The scripture says it like this in Proverbs chapter 11. It says to give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So in generosity, give people things that you would want to receive. I heard this story at my dad's funeral and I had no idea about it until that day. But um, every um, one year, um, at the business that my dad ran, the Lions Club. I don't know if you're all familiar with the Lions Club where I'm from. It's huge. Um, in Indiana, the Lions Club is a massive organization. And so one day the Lions Club come walking into the business and they said, uh, we're here to present you with this plaque for your years of generosity to the Lions Club. And uh, they said, I'm sorry that this company doesn't donate to the Lions Club. Why would you bring us a plaque? We don't donate. And they said, well, there is a guy that comes around uh, every Christmas uh, to the Lions Club, and he makes a very generous donation. Well, this year, we were able to follow him out, and he got into one of your company trucks. And, and so we know where he works, so it has to be from your company. But it was my father. And my father was being generous to an organization, and I didn't realize that my, the only way that my uh, father and his brothers and sisters had milk when they were teenagers and kids was that the Lions Club donated milk to them. And so my dad remembered that that organization took care of them, and so he would go every Christmas and make a generous donation to that organization because he never forgot that they helped him in his time of need, and he wanted to help others in their time of need. I think the world would be a much better place if we were all that generous. I learned, that's all right, you, you're honoring my dad, not me. So I learned about honor. I learned that you honor people for who they are. I, I learned that you honor people regardless of their walk of life, that every person is worthy of honor. I think the most humbling thing at my father's funeral is that there were homeless people and there were CEOs of Fortune 500 companies that were walking through there to pay their respects to my dad. We need to honor one another. And I think you'll honor people a whole lot differently if you know their story. If you just knew what kind of made them tick and why they are the way they are, uh, you would have a better understanding of who they are. We need to begin to honor people regardless of what we have preconceived uh, notions or prejudices of, of them. And we are prejudging people. And so um, I, I learned this little lesson um, I was, uh, of course, responsible for helping clean up uh, after my dad had passed away. And so um, at one of the residences, my dad had dressers full of socks, dressers full of socks. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, why in the world would this guy have all these socks? Most of them had tags on them. They had never been worn before. My mom told me the story uh, after uh, my grandfather passed away. My dad didn't have any money to go buy socks. He had one pair of socks, and every day after school, he would go home, and he would wash those socks in the sink and then dry them out and then wear those same socks back to school the next day. And one day, the socks either weren't dry or they got a hole in them, and he wasn't able to wear any socks to school, and he was getting bullied at school because that day because he didn't have any socks. And so when my dad became successful, every time he found a nice pair of socks or a pair of socks that were really comfortable, he bought every one of them. And so today I'm the recipient of the Michael McKinnis uh, socks in a box club. And I have socks now for the rest of my life because of my dad. And, but when you know people's story, you begin to honor them differently. And every one of us have hurts and pains and sorrows and wounds in our lives. And we ought to honor people. I think sometimes we begin to prejudge people like, well, what makes that? Why is that? And if you would actually know their story, you would handle each other much differently. There is not a person in this room that doesn't have hurts, doesn't have pain, doesn't have sorrow in their life. And we need to begin to honor each other. I also learned from my father that there are no degrees when it comes to integrity. You either have it or you don't. If you'll steal a dollar, you'll have no problem stealing a million dollars. If you'll lie about something little, you'll lie about something big. You either have integrity 
or you don't. I also learned to have a little bit of a flash or panache. My dad loved loud socks, loud ties, loud colors, and fast cars. And if the car was fast, the music had to be as loud as the car was fast. I told this story. Uh, many of you got to see the car that uh, my, was my, one of my dad's pride and joys. I received his gold Mustang. And uh, the first time I ever drove that car, uh, of course, my mom and dad had a house out in the country, and they had a house in the city. And so my dad, um, one night he wanted some ribs. And so he asked Melissa and I, uh, he said, if you'll fly, I'll buy and I said, well, okay, that's great. And he threw me the keys to that Mustang. And he said, take the Mustang. Well, I'd never driven it before. And so I get in the car. The top is down. And the music is pumping. And it's Michael Jackson uh, singing The Man in the Mirror. And it is loud. And, and, uh, and uh, I mean no offense by this, but just so you can understand where I was going. So I left the country. And I was driving down to the hood to get ribs in a gold Mustang. And Michael Jackson is playing. And, and, I, and I can't figure out how to turn it down. I don't know where it's even coming from. And Michael, now we're at the Billy Jean. And Billy Jean is not my lover and all these things. And, and, and I'm sitting in the drive through trying to order rib tips from my dad. And, and so Melissa and I, we come around. And as we come around, the lady who is working the drive through uh, leans out and she sees the car. And she's saying something to everybody else. And as we get up, she says, that ain't your car. I said, it's my dad's car. She said, uh, I, I know the owner of that car, and that is not your car. And I said, no, it's my dad's car. She said, you show me your driver's license to prove that you're Michael McKinnis' son, or I'm calling the police on you. <laughs> Here, I thought I was going to get carjacked, and I was getting ready to get arrested for stealing my dad's car. My dad loved loud things. The louder, the better. And so uh, he loved loud music at their house. Uh, during the summer, music played 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He had this stereo and speakers on the side of it. And then when he passed through the church, uh, he, he, after various noise complaints to the police department about the music playing out in front of the church, the police department showed up. My dad said, look, if, if they can, you know, thump their rap music, I can can thump my Gaither music. <clears throat> he, he loved it. And so sometimes we, we look at people, we go, man, you know, boy, they're really loud or whatever. Let, let people be who they are. Don't try to squelch them down. I was supposed to dress like a superhero today. So I wore a yellow tie to dress like my father. And sometimes, you know, we, we, we live in such a society that wants to make everybody conform to a certain standard. And God did not call any of us to fit in. God called every one of us to stand out. You are to be a transformer, not a conformer. So be the you that God called you to be. And if you like loud cars and fast cars, just don't live in energy. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. I live in energy and I have that Mustang. I learned this from my dad. I learned to love life. And how you love life is you live it. I want to ask some of you, what in the world are you waiting on? Live life. Man, live it with everything you got, man. I mean, one of the last things that I did with my dad when he was still at the house was I'd been there. We'd been up all night. And he's like, hey, man, you want to watch a movie? And I said, dad, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. He said, good. It'll be over by 530. Live life. I mean, you know, you, you get two dates in life, the day you're born and the day you die. And everything that you do in the middle of it is dependent upon you, man. Make your dash count for everything you got. Live it. I mean, there'd be nothing for my dad in the middle of the night. Hey, let's go get some ribs. Let's go get some ice cream. Just live it. And Melissa and I are that way. The other night, I mean, like it's Thursday night, we'd worked all day. And Melissa's like, you know, what do you want to do? I'm like, it's date night. Thursday night is our Friday night. And so, you know, she starts getting her pajamas on at like 7 o'clock. I'm like, no, no, no. We're going to go eat. She goes, where are we going to go eat? I go, I don't know. We're going to go eat. We drove all the way to Paducah because we went to eat at Flamingo Row. If you've never ate there, it is a little bit of paradise. Paradise in Kentucky. And we went to Flamingo Row. I just needed to feel the beach and hear the music and do all that stuff. You got to live life spontaneous. And how you, how you love life is you live life. Jesus came so that we, the people of God, could have life and life more abundantly. And we need to start living life and living it really well. And my dad packed all the life he could into, that, into his life. And it isn't the amount of years that you live. 
It's the amount of years you live in the life that you have. Live them. Love and do all those things. One of the things my dad taught me is you face your fears head on. Uh, my, my family, we're a traveling family. I'm missing one state. I'm missing the state of Alaska from getting all 50 states. And I've been to uh, most of the province, the southern provinces of Canada, been in and out of Mexico all the time. And my dad taught us you face your fears head on. And so we would go hiking up the mountains and stuff. And every time we'd get up on the top of the mountain, my dad would never quite go out to the edge of the mountain. And he had a fear of heights. And it would give him vertigo when he would look over the top of it. And so my mom has a fear of water. And my dad had no problem making my mom face her fears. I mean, one day we were uh, in Big Bend National Park. If you've never been there, you can cross the Rio Grande River. You just get into a rowboat. And we got into this little rowboat, all six of us, and they didn't have any oars. And we're going to cross the Rio Grande River in a boat that has no oars. And my mom said, how in the world are we going to get to the other side? And the guy just picks up a rope. And he says, this is how we're going to. My mom said, there's nobody on the other side to catch that rope. About that time, a guy slid out from behind a bush or a tree. And they threw him the rope. And we crossed the Rio Grande River, got out, drove, rode on burrows into Eden, New Mexico. My mom, my dad had no problem making other people face his fears. But he had a fear of heights. And so one day he calls me and says, hey, I'm going to go skydiving. cool. So my dad's philosophy was to conquer his fear of heights. He began to jump out of airplanes because my dad taught me to face your fears head on. If you ask me today, I would tell you that I'm afraid of airplanes. And so I'm going to face my fear head on. I'm going to stay on that airplane. You guys are good. I, <laughs> I learned this lesson, and this is an important lesson. I learned that the only validation you ever need in life comes from God. Every person, every individual searches for validation. So the question is not if a man is searching for validation the question is, where is he seeking validation from? And what we're looking for is that stamp of approval, our worth, confirmation about who we are. And people say, I, I, I don't know if I'm seeking for validation, but I would ask you, what makes you feel like you have worth or that you matter? I mean, is it from other people? Is it from social media? What is it that gives you that feeling that you're significant, that I matter in this world? And I think so many of us are trying to get it from people, from work, from friends, from accomplishments, or from, from your spouse, from your mate. You're trying to, to be validated by what they think of you. If they can validate you, they can also invalidate you. And I've learned a lot over the last few months. I probably learned more about myself, learned about pain, sorrow, grief, more in the last three months than I've learned in my life. I tried to do the math just before I walked out here, but it's safe to say that in my nine years of pastoring, I've done and officiated well over 250 funerals. I did one yesterday. And, it, and I told that family, up until three months ago, I did not understand the sting of death. It's one thing to read about it, to talk about it, to quote scriptures about it. I mean, I've had grandfather, my grandfather, my grandmother passed away, but it, it was nothing in comparison to my dad. And I think sometimes we, we want people, and so as, I've, as I have went through this process and, and more in dealing with my own mother than my father and watching my mom become invalidated by other people, more than any other time in my life, this lesson that my dad taught us comes to fruition. You cannot seek your stamp of approval, your worth, your significance on anything other than Jesus Christ. 
Because if it's upon man or if it's upon uh, individuals or if it's upon your job, once that goes away, then you feel like you have no significance, you have no worth, you have no value whatsoever. And if it's based on people and they say, man, man, you did a great job, you did a great job, boys, you did amazing. But then what happens when they don't say that? And so if your validation is coming through those compliments and that praise and those accolades, when that goes away, then you feel invalidated. And so you have to seek your validation only from God. That is the solution to all of our heart's problems is to begin to go after our stamp of approval. Our significance and our value, it comes from God. And people say, I'm working so hard to be validated by God for God's stamp of approval to be placed upon my life. My friend, it's already there. God did it through his love for us. And it was before you even did anything. While we were yet sinners, while we were ugly, while we were dirty, he loved us. He put his stamp of approval on us, and he offered up Jesus Christ. That's how we're validated. And if you, if you don't do that, then what's going to happen is your heart is going to get hurt. As you, begin be, you become invalidated by other people, it begins to hurt your heart. And Proverbs says that the heart is the wellspring of life. And so when your heart gets hurt, it begins to destroy and you begin to become depressed and you become, you know, disenfranchised with people. Listen, that person didn't call you. They didn't die for you. They, they re- listen, in the grand scheme of things, those people don't matter. The only person's opinion of you that matters is God's. And we need to go after God's opinion of us, not man's opinion of us. It'll free you just to be pleasing to God instead of everybody else. You're on a treadmill that never ends trying to please people. Go after God with everything you got. I learned this lesson, and I learn it probably every week as pastor. I can try to convince you. To go after God's validation, I, I, I can preach with eloquent words. I can try to do many things. But a man who is convinced against his will is a man who is unconvinced still. You can sit in church and you hear all the sermons in the world. Here's the deal. Only God can change your heart. And until you turn your life over to God, you're going to be unconvinced. And it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter how many marriage counselors you go to until you turn your life over to God. You're doing it against your will. You are going to have to submit your will to God so that God can change you. Our job and my job as pastor is only to present and to love. It is God's job to convict. It's God who would get into your life. My dad taught me to love God to love my wife, and by loving my wife, I've loved my children. And he taught me in that order. You love God, love your wife, and by loving your wife, you've loved your children. My dad told me one time, he said, listen, you didn't marry Melissa for children. You married Melissa for Melissa. And you don't stay together because you have children. You stay together because you decided to be together. I hear people say this all the time. Well, we're going to stay together for the children. Well, you didn't get together for the children. You got together because you loved one another. And I think sometimes in our society right now, it is we put our children first. So uh, you can email me all you want, but I think the best thing you can do for your children is to love your spouse. How I love Morgan and Zoe is to love their mom. And if I love their mom, then mom and dad will stay together. And if mom and dad stay together, my children have an advantage over a lot of children. Because children who have both mom and dad in their home have a distinct advantage over those who do not. That's just the facts. That's the studies. And if you love God and you love your spouse, you are showing them love and you love your children by loving your spouse. I learned this lesson because my dad taught Melissa this lesson. 
when we first got married, my dad told Melissa, he said, if you ever have a problem with Jason, don't call your parents, call me. And how I know that my dad taught that lesson is I have been the recipient of many phone calls from my father. It went something like this. Jason, this is your dad. I know that. I just got off the phone with Melissa. What's that again? You're breaking up, Dad. You've got a bad connection. I think we, a lot of us would be better off if the in-laws would stop trying to be outlaws. I learned the value of a work ethic. My dad told me, and this is maybe crude to you, but this is just basically it. Jason, if you show up and you shut up, you'll go up. If you'll just show up to work on time, ready to work, you're better than 90% of the people in this country. And if you'll shut up. I mean, don't be that employee that after the first day of work, you know everything and you don't need any further instruction. And you'll go up. I learned that if you're ever going to come to a battle of the minds with my father, you had better be armed and bring reinforcements. Especially if you were going to talk about Jesus. My dad firmly believed that you better study to show thyself approved. A workman that needeth not be ashamed. And a lot of people are being swayed by every wind of doctrine because they don't know the word of God. We, the people of God, ought to know the Word of God better than the people in the world. My dad's, one of my dad's favorite statements written in the front of his Bible, and it's a lesson that we learned, that stuff doesn't just work itself out. God works stuff out. I hear all these people, well, we're just going to kind of let it ride and just kind of let it, no, no. You need to turn over to God and let God begin to work the stuff out of your life. I learned the value of discipline. My dad and mom firmly believed in that scripture where it said, if you spare the rod, you'll spoil the child. My parents firmly believed that, and usually I got to choose the rod. There was something about my father, though. I, I, I probably, I really cannot recollect the last time I, I ever got a spanking from my father. Matter of fact, I would have rather my father spank me than talk to me. There, there was something about the way my father carried himself that to hear the words, I'm disappointed in you, cut me like a knife. I mean, I, I, so I told this story at the 9 o'clock, so I might as well tell it so that, you know, half the crowd didn't gossip about it. And you're like, oh, I didn't hear that story. But I, um, I was a senior in high school, and I wanted to go out. It was New Year's Eve, and I wanted to go out. And um, so I went and asked for permission to go out. My dad said, you know, yes, doors lock at midnight. Where are you going? Why well, didn't want to tell him where I was going. So I told him I was going to a house that he would approve of. And so we, I went to this other house, went to the party, and uh, about 10 minutes to midnight, I knew I needed to get home. The doors locked at midnight. I went out to start my car. My car would not start. I wasn't going to call my dad to have him come to a house that I was not supposed to be at to pick me up, to bring me home, because that would have been the longest ride of my life. So I asked one of my buddies to take me home, and he dropped me off way away from the front door of the house. And I creeped up and walked in, and my dad was sitting in his office. And, and Jason, come in here and talk to me. I'm good, Dad. I mean, church is in the morning. I, you know, I'm really tired. i got to feed the pigs and, you know, all these. I, I don't want to talk to you. And he's like, no, no, come in here. Come here. Who brought you home? I drove my cell phone. No, you didn't. Well, how do you know? I know the sound of your car. I didn't hear your car. He said, uh, tomorrow's church. And tomorrow, you're going to stand and testify about the grace of God. <laughs> so we go to church. I thought he's forgotten. Come all the way to the end of the church service. I'm like, yes, he's going to dismiss. We're going to go Popeyes, and he's going to get white chicken. We're going to be great. <laughs> he said, um, before we go, my son. 
He's going to testify about the grace of God. Jason, would you stand? <laughs> so we get in the car after church after I've testified about the grace of God. And my dad drives me, without even asking me, my dad drives me to where my car is at. I get in the car, and it starts without even working on it. <laughs> now you understand why I was terrified of my father. I don't know what he was doing in the whole time, but he knew exactly where it was at. And so my dad, I, I just learned to be honest with my father. Probably the most powerful lesson I ever learned from my dad is the power and the lesson of restoration and reconciliation. I learned that a life that is reconciled with God is a life filled with restoration. And because of that lesson, I learned that past performance doesn't always equal future results. I mean, that's a business adage. If you look at somebody's past, you can pretty much dictate their future. My family's entire trajectory changed on March the 18th of 1979. Man, I, I know that date so well. I would take my dad to the doctor's appointments. They're, of course, trying to explain what is happening in his body. And so they'd ask him, you know, the normal questions, you know, uh, do you drink? No. Do you smoke? No. You know, do you do drugs? No. When's the last time you had a drink? March the 18th of 1979, he'd say. When's the last time you smoked? March the 18th, 1979. And doctors said, I mean, without fail, almost every doctor, they'd be like, man, you got that date down. He's like, that's the last day I smoke, I drink, I cuss. That's the last day. That's the day that Jesus Christ got a hold of my life. March the 18th, 1979. I mean, my birth date is 1977, but I, I would tell you that the most important day of the McKinnis family is March the 18th of 1979. It is the day that the past of our family was wiped away. And God created a new creature. And my family went from living under a curse to living under the blessings of the Lord. March the 18th, 1979, a day that my dad reconciled his life with God. And God began to give restoration to our family. The scripture says that anything that the enemy steals from you, God restores to you. Man, and some of us need to turn our past over to God and be reconciled to God. And allow God to begin to restore things into our life. Statistics would have said that my dad would have been an alcoholic in prison. Instead, my dad wound up pastor your church till the day he died today as i preach here my brother's preaching in michigan a life reconciled with god is a life filled with restoration and a divine encounter with jesus changes your future no matter what your past is when jesus comes into your life it changes everything i caught most of those lessons i wasn't taught them I watched them be laid out in front of me. I wanted to read just a poem, maybe just to summarize my life and challenge you to live your life this way. It said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely show the way. For the eyes, a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Good counsel is confusing, but examples are always clear. And the best of all the preachers are those who live their creed. For to see good put into action is what everybody needs. I can soon learn how to do it if you let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast it may run. And the lectures you deliver may be very fine and true. But I'd rather get my lesson by observing what you do. For I may, may misunderstand you. And the high advice you give. But there will be no misunderstanding. How you act. And how you live. People are watching you. How you live. How you act. And each of us are teaching other people lessons. Of how to live. 
What lessons are they learning from the life that you're leading? John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. He said, I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. And I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. And I write unto you little children because you have known the father. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. And I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. John is describing spiritual life. In the natural life, there are actually four stages of life. There is, you know, childhood. There is youth. There is adulthood. And then there's, thank God, I'm still here. Four stages of life. Spiritually speaking, there are three stages of life. There are children, being a child, being a young man, and being a spiritual father. John describes out about a child. He says, a child of God knows the father and his sins are forgiven. That, that's what it takes in. And the church is filled with sons, children. We know the Father, and our sins are forgiven. That's what it takes to be a child of God, a son of God. Know the Father. Have your sins forgiven. Then he says, then the next step is you go from there, just knowing the Father, having your sins forgiven, you become a young man. The young man knows the Father, his sins are forgiven. And then John says, he has overcome the evil one. And, I, and so in the church where we've got people who know God, their sins are forgiven. And then we have this next class, the super spiritual people. They know God, their sins are forgiven, and they've overcome the wicked one. How do you overcome the wicked one? Jesus gave this example in the wilderness when he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. But my friend, it is not merely enough to quote scripture, you must submit to it. You have to submit to the Word of God in your life, and you become a young man. And I think where the church is lacking is in the next stage. We have many sons who know the Father and their sins are forgiven. And we have many people who know how to overcome the wicked one. But we must go on into maturity and become fathers. The fa the, a spiritual father, he knows the Father. His sins are forgiven. He know how, knows how to overcome the wicked one. But a spiritual father is one who just enjoys being the presence of Jesus. We're not looking for validation from anybody else. I know who I am. I know what I've been called to do. And I'm just going to enjoy being in the presence of the king. And then a father turns around and encourages those who aren't sons to become sons. Know the father. Let your sins be forgiven. And then, here's how you overcome the wicked one. But don't let them stop there. Let them go on to maturity, become spiritual fathers of themselves. We must encourage people to know the Father. And if you don't know the Father today, it would be a good day to get to know Him. You'll be taught a lot of lessons. You'll be taught how to live. Every lesson that my father taught me, there are scriptures to back every one of them up. Everything that my natural father knew, he learned from his heavenly father. He didn't have a dad to teach him, so he turned to God. And if you don't have those people in your life, turn to God. Know the father. Your sins will be forgiven. And he'll teach you how to overcome the wicked one. And then let us all begin to mature and become spiritual fathers just enjoying the presence of God, living the life that He has blessed us with. And how do you love this life? You live it. Live this life of a Christian with reckless abandon and watch other people catch the lessons that you're teaching by the life you live for Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me across this building?
If you could, wherever you're at, if there is a, a man standing by you, would you kind of make your way to them and just place your hand upon their shoulder or however you feel comfortable? I don't know if you know this or not, but our men are under attack. They're under attack in our society and in our nation. But in the sound of my voice are some great men, men of God who are raising up their families. And so I'm asking you as a body of believers, would you pray over these men right now? So Heavenly Father, we lift our dads, our grandfathers, we lift the men of this house to you. May they know you. May they understand you. May you give them guidance and give them wisdom and give them strength. Lord, would you grant them favor. Lord, may everything that they put their hand to, may it be blessed. Lord, would you put a hedge of protection around about them. Lord, even though they've made mistakes, they've failed, they have faltered, may they get back up and go again. Lord, may you teach them, lead them, and guide them. In Jesus' name, we ask this in your name. And all of the men of God's house said, amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face shine down upon you. And may you have a wonderful Father's Day in Jesus' name. God bless you.